Hello, and thank you for joining us for the second day of Israel Drama International Exposure of Israeli Theater. And um, a special welcome and good afternoon to our dear guests from uh, Asia. We are here um, in a special panel which, is, which was originally um, organized especially for you, and we are very happy to have you with, uh, with us uh, today. Uh, this session is going to try and shed some light uh, on the very live and kicking theatrical scene here in Israel. Please bear in mind that Israel has the highest rate of theater goers per capita in the world. Uh, with all due respect to places like the West End in London or Broadway in New York, uh, what keeps the industry going in these places are mainly the tourists and not so much the local people, whereas here in Israel, in Tel Aviv alone, uh, up until this current crisis, uh, we, we had some 50 different shows every evening. So the scene here is very live and kicking, and we'll try in the next uh, uh, hour and a half to try and expose you to the diversity and richness of this scene. To do so, I gathered here some very distinguished guests, uh, which I'd like to introduce to you. Uh, first of all, uh, Joshua Sobol, Joshua Sobol. Uh, who is definitely the most successful and well-known Israeli playwright uh, in the world. His masterpiece, Ghetto, had already over 80 productions around the globe, including at the prestigious National Theatre in London, directed by Nicholas Heitner, and uh, it won the Critics Circle London Theatre Awards for Best New Play. Uh, to this day, he wrote over 80 uh, plays, which were translated to English, French, German, Japanese, Italian, Hungarian, Russian, Polish, Finnish, Turkish, Spanish, Yiddish, and many, many more who counts. Uh, by the way, I, I apologize, I forgot to, to tell you that in the chat, those of you who speak um, a Chinese Mandarin can see uh, an uh, intermittent uh, written translation uh, done by our wonderful translator, Eugene E, thank you so much. So I speak English, we all speak English, but you have the opportunity to follow the Chinese translation. Uh, next to him sits the wonderful Shimrit Ron, who is the director of the Hanoch Levin Institute for Israeli Drama, and is responsible uh, for, I think, the um, international success of Israeli dramaturgy around the world. Um, you, you contributed a lot uh, to this trend, and, and we thank you, and we'll speak about it later on. And to my right, two wonderful uh, theater makers. The first one is Hadar Galron, uh, which I guess most of you have already came across Mikve, which is uh, also, um, uh, you can see um, um, it on uh, our uh, wonderful uh, website. And Mikve, her first play, had already 18 different productions all over the world. Uh, her last play, uh, Jewish Enough for Hitler, has just been produced in the Czech Republic, and its opening night has been postponed no less than three times due to the corona. Um, and you'll tell us a bit about it. <laughs> uh, Galron is also an active actress and stand-up comedian, and her one-woman show, Whistle, is also part of our program, and we'll discuss it uh, too. And uh, last but not least, Michal Svironi, uh, actress, director, uh, creator. Uh, her works uh, have been performed in uh, 20 countries around the globe. She studied in Paris and is well known here and outside Israel for her original personal the theatrical language and, uh, if I may say so, for the tons of humor you managed to inject <laughs> into your pieces. So, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. And, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good e they whatever. Are. They are. <laughs> All over the place. Time has completely changed its, its uh, meaning in the last eight or nine months. That's right. You know what, Hadar, let's, let's start because uh, I, I mentioned the frustration you must have experienced, you know, with, with the um, postponing of, of your production in Czech. Tell us a bit about this, uh, what well, you've been through. Yeah, this, this was my horizon because everything here was closed and I, I, I could go to the, to the rehearsals in the Czech Republic I had a letter from the Minister of Culture in the Czech Republic saying that I am essential there for rehearsals, although there were no flights to the Czech Republic, so I had to go through, through Vienna. 
but I got to the, air, to the airport and then they told me that the, the, the flight that I have a ticket for has been cancelled, so I had to go through Hungary. And um, I found myself uh, in a kind of a very dramatic situation on my way. Everything about this production has been very dramatic. I had to find, I went to Hungary, I had to find a place to stay overnight in Corona times where everything is closed. And I reached the, I reached the train station at uh, 6.15 a.m. And Hungarians normally don't speak English. And at 6.15, nobody speaks English. And, you know, if you just speak to them in English, they, they, they kind of made me feel invisible. Mm. I began myself to think that maybe I'm not, maybe I don't exist, you mm. know. I, excuse me, where is the, and the only, I am, my, my, my ticket is in Czech, my train ticket is in Czech. I need to get to the, I need to get to the train to get to my rehearsals because I'm essential. I'm essential for one few, few weeks in this <laughs> corona crisis. Somebody said I'm essential. And, and I, I, I see a, a man wearing a uniform of the train station. I go to him, um, excuse me, can you? No, nothing. Okay, I walk around a bit. It's a big place. Uh, I think it's getting later. Really, I need to get this train to Prague. I need to get this train to Prague. Please, can you just tell me um, where the platform is? And he did me a favor and did something like, like a general kind of. So I go in this, sorry, Michal. <laughs> I go in this general direction. And, and I don't train. meet Michal, I meet a <laughs> clock. I meet a clock. And this clock tells me that in two minutes the train is leaving. And I go back to him and I say, listen, I need to get this train to Prague, okay? And my mind, I'm thinking, my crazy Jewish mind, I'm thinking, I'm sure that if this was a train to Auschwitz, he would be much more helpful. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then he just tells me, instead of going like this, he says, like this and this. And there, the, the, the platform is literally half a minute away. So I got to the second day of rehearsals, but still it was postponed because uh, three days before the premiere, the theaters in the Czech Republic closed down. Oh my God. Okay, we'll, we'll get to see at least a clip of, of the rehearsals yes. later on. Uh, Joshua, how are you doing these days? Well, uh, I, I'm doing whatever what I'm doing, uh, but have been doing for the last uh, 40 years or so. <laughs> Uh, getting up in the morning, sitting down at my desk, opening my computer and writing. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, these last eight or nine months have been very uh, active, very fruitful. And, and you uh, came out with, with two uh, new plays? Uh, yeah, I wrote two new plays. I, actually, almost three, because uh, the first one I finished writing when the corona broke out, when the corona crisis mm -hmm. broke out, and then these other two plays. So. Uh, I think for playwrights or What's writers in general, there is no, no, not much difference if there is a, a yeah. pan. <laughs> yeah. Yes, when your kids don't have school, you know. Oh. Yeah, yeah, when your kids go to school, that's right. Well, yeah, you are right. Yeah. Different I generation. That some playwrights still have uh, kids. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Michal, what about you? You you two had to to stop rehearsing your new. Yes. Uh, well, I was supposed to, yeah, we were supposed to play uh, my new show, uh, Carte Blanche, that we uh, will see here mm -hmm. in this international exposure. So um, we were supposed to play it in uh, the Teatro Neto Festival in uh, April, and uh, three weeks before it was not only postponed, but unfortunately canceled. completely yeah. cancelled. Yeah. Yes, uh, we went. unfortunately, yeah, it was, this opportunity was taken to destroy a 30 years festival. So it was a big um, tragedy. And um, well, I think that, you know, uh, as a creative person, I'm always creative. It doesn't matter if I have, uh, it was difficult in the beginning, like, you know, to be close with my child, <laughs> hyperactive child. <laughs> uh, so that was difficult, but it was also wonderful. And I think that creativity, in the beginning, I had like a stop of, uh, ability to, to, to do anything. But then uh, it opened up other uh, ways. And uh, I think it's quite amazing because uh, even though I was born like uh, a person that knows what, what I wanted to do, I knew like when I was five, okay? Mm -hmm. And many people are, wow, you're so lucky, you know what you want. But still in this field, you can f still, you know, find more and more what is the right way. And it's so... Um, 
it, this field of theater is so rich, mm -hmm. and uh, so many people do theater, but so little people do what you know you each do. of us do. Yeah, mm -hmm. everybody is doing something very special. I think. So uh, in the beginning, I started painting more, mm -hmm. and I uh, I had wow. in my mind to make a, an exhibition. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, actually, I did it a few weeks ago. Um, and it was amazing because even there I understood that what was interesting for me was not only to show my uh, paintings because I'm a theater person and also for the people who came it was very difficult for them to understand that it's an exhibition and not a show like they say so wh wh when is it does it start can I get <laughs> tickets or, no it's a sh it's really it's <laughs> you come and I understood that what I was looking for was the meeting with the people this is what is the most important for me in theater and also in this uh, gallery that I created to myself, um, I was looking for that. So it's, again, it's taking me and this show of Carte Blanche, uh, blank slate, I think it's slate. Can, slate, blank slate in yes. English. Uh, it takes it, I, I find like I can do other things with it. Uh, you know, I can adapt it you know to what? another let's, kind let's, of theater. Let's see the short trailer that we have of, of right. Carte Blanche from... Um, from your rehearsal room, it, it, yes. it didn't open it's not, yet. It, we but, never finished the show, okay. so <laughs> beware. Okay. Some shows. The messy finish. around in the studio. So, can can we see the the short clip of? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Really Experience. looking forward. Yeah. yeah. Very promising. Shimrit, how is the institution for Israeli drama doing these days? Okay, so um, actually the institute, the Hanoch Levin Institute of Israeli Drama, uh, organizes this uh, Israel Drama International Exposure of Israeli Theater. And every year we do something that looks today like a science fiction uh, fantasy. We invite, actually invite real 50 people to Tel Aviv, like uh, artistic directors and festival directors from all over the world. They are actually coming to Tel Aviv and shaking hands with people and they're gathering in theaters and they're going to tours in Tel Aviv and taking buses, you know, all the things that we are not supposed to do uh, because uh, we want to expose the uh, wonders of the Israeli uh, diverse theater uh, to them. And, uh, this year we said, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this event? Are we not going to stop it? So what you see is this event. And um, on one hand, it's new to us and really uh, uh, strange, you know, sometimes uh, I think, well, it's, a, it's actually a studio with cameras and, and Zoom, and we are all having too many Zoom meetings. But on the other hand, it's an opportunity to, to meet and to share ideas, and I see that there is a lot of, um, everybody wants to, 
to, to share ideas and to talk about the situation in their countries. And suddenly Israel is not a very special place in the world. It's not just one single country in the Middle East with unique history and uh, political uh, complications. We are all in the same boat. We are all having masks and alcohol gel and social distance. And we know what we're talking about when we say the theaters are closed since March. And it's unbelievable because the theater people are the safest people in the world. But here we are, and I hope you will um, there is a sentence which we all hate. It's called uh, making a lemonade out, out of the lemon. But this is what we are doing now. We are meeting we're and, and you know, because maybe, maybe you wouldn't have come to Israel because it's too far away and it's too expensive to fly and it's not really uh, possible to, to clear the schedule. But now you can be with us and you can meet. And maybe after this situation uh, ends, you can actually invite theater um, uh, shows and plays to your countries. Mm -hmm. So that's it. That's the lemonade. And, and, and you and the, and the institute are, are the address to um, Yes, and, and to usually to if, if you through, are all the, through all the year, yeah. the institute promotes the Israeli original playwriting. So playwrights such as Hadar Galon and um, Joshua Sobol is, is a unique uh, phenomenon. So he's... Um, he has other agents, but uh, we promote uh, all the Israeli theater, all the Israeli uh, playwrights. Uh, it's Adar Galon and Hanoch Levin and Maya Arad Yasur and Gur Korel. Many years, uh, many names that you don't know anything about, but I'm really happy to tell you. So um, maybe we'll have time to this. Yeah. And this session is, is, uh, is the first step in order to expose some of them. Let's start with Hanoch Levin first. Uh, the institute is, is called after him. Uh, he is considered by many to be the most influential playwright uh, here. And uh, we'll just see a short trailer of uh, some of his international productions. I can tell you that in recent years, Hanoch Levin plays uh, were translated into no less than 23 uh, different languages and uh, enjoyed some over 200 productions worldwide. And let's see just this short clip of his works. Debajo de mi cinturón brota un culoso nervio, dos bolas carnosas rosado color, un surco fino en medio. De siempre me sigue el oculto detrás y donde quiera que va. like the ending. Uh, by the way, Shimrit, you, you told me that our wonderful translator this morning... Yes, uh, Eugene E. She's not only a wonderful translator and person, she's also a producer and she produced in China 
uh, two shows of Hanoch Levin in uh, 2019. There was a big production of Requiem, uh, directed by uh, the Israeli director Yair Sherman. And Eugene Yi is the producer, and he toured all over China, and I hope it will be able to tour again. It's a wonderful production. So Eugene Yi, thank you from here, uh, from your... And actually, we have, I think we also have a short clip of this wonderful production. So uh, let's just get a clue about how it looked. Requiem, his last play uh, in, in the Chinese production. Beautiful. Joshua, you too had your uh, Chinese experience with, with the international hit of, of Ghetto. You directed yes, Ghetto. Yes, uh, I directed Ghetto uh, two years ago. Uh, it opened on November in uh, 2018 mm -hmm. um, at the uh, magnificent uh, uh, culture company in Beijing. And uh, the, the production toured uh, 24 different uh, cities in China mm -hmm. until uh, March 2020, when everything stopped. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very special experience. Uh, well, they, uh, were, they were interested in the ghetto after uh, Gesha visited China with the production of my play, Village. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they saw it in Beijing, and so they asked who wrote this play, and uh, someone gave them over my name, and they contacted and me. And it was the first time Ghetto was produced in, 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 China. in China? In China, it was the first time. There was a production in Japan in 95, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which started, it opened in Kobe shortly after the earthquake. Yeah. Uh, like three months after the earthquake, I went there, and the entire town was still uh, in ruins. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the show got uh, later on it went over to Tokyo and they received like six uh, different awards for best play and best production in Japan in 95. So for and those few who don't know anything about Ghetto, just, yes. just a short you know, description of what it's about. Well, Ghetto is about a theater that functioned in the uh, Ghetto of Vilnius uh, for 18 months during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Vilnius was the first town where the, the Nazis started the extermination of Jews. Uh, because uh, they occupied uh, Lithuania in uh, June 41, and then they started this kind of um, genocide in Lithuania. And Vilnius was a town where there were like 80,000 Jews before the war. They killed like uh, 60,000 of them, and then the, the rest they uh, pushed into a, a seven small streets and created a ghetto in Vilnius. Uh, finally, there were like 15,000 inhabitants in this ghetto. And uh, shortly after they uh, started uh, to run this ghetto, the Germans gave an, a permission to open a theater there. And uh, the uh, Judenrat, the Jewish uh, council, that uh, was uh, the authority, the Jewish authority of the ghetto, under, under German uh, control, um, they uh, encouraged uh, a few actors who, who remained alive, who survived their killings, to, to open that theater. And uh, the, the artistic director of the theater, his name was Israel Segal, he survived the war. And you uh, met with him? I met him, and uh, I had long uh, conversations with him, interviews, uh, and he uh, gave me a lot of information about the theater. And the, the most amazing thing about this theater was that uh, first of all, they included s songs which were written in the ghetto uh, and composed music in the ghetto and performed. Uh, and performed there. And the songs, when I got the compilation of the, uh, the anthology of the songs that were written and composed in the ghetto and in other ghettos, I was totally, I would say, amazed at the uh, kind of uh, vitality that, was, uh, that came out of those songs and of the music. Because the composers, they composed tangos and foxtrot hmm. and uh, you name it, all kinds of, uh, of uh, dance music. Uh, I asked the survivors uh, what it meant to them, people who lived in the Vilna ghetto, and, uh, and they told me that for them, the, the, the fact that there was a theater there in those horrible, awful, horrendous times was for them a kind of... Uh, um, a power plant that gave them energy to go on with their life. Because they, one of the women who survived, she, she said to me, the Germans not only tried to kill us, not they tried, they, they did kill us physically, but before killing us physically, they tried to kill the human value uh, of each one of us by humiliating us, by treating us like animals, uh, and uh, like rats, she said. And then the theater gave us that feeling that we are not rats. We are still human beings. We can enjoy art. We can enjoy uh, music. And the fact is that uh, this theater that could seat 300 uh, people, they sold every evening more than 300 tickets. They sold like 330, 350 tickets sometimes. Sold out. They sold out. They were overbooked, overbooked uh, almost every night. Yeah. And, and, uh... First of all, no, no, what, I, what an important reminder. Yes, uh, uh, there was an interesting uh, uh, event then in, in the rehearsal room in China. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, general manager of the theater, uh, Mr. Uh, Wang Keran, he used to attend the rehearsals because he was himself uh, a man of theater. He was a, an actor and then a director, and he wrote plays also. Mm -hmm. And after one of the rehearsals, he came to me and he said, listen, you know the uh, prologue of the play uh, doesn't uh, doesn't uh, do the right work because the original uh, prologue of the play was uh, that uh, the artistic director Sal Segal tells the audience that the day when uh, the leader of the ghetto Jack Wiggins was murdered, he was sitting in his uh, office and reading plays written in the ghetto, and one Keran said to me, "Listen, for the Chinese people when they when they hear that uh, he was sitting in the office and reading plays." Mm, so what's the, uh, what's, what's the, the big deal? What's the big deal? Yeah, what's the so he said, can you find another opening for the play? Mm -hmm. And when he said it to me, I all of a sudden remembered that among the interviews that I uh, carried out in my research that uh, preceded the mm -hmm. writing of the play, I met a survivor in Paris, a survivor of the Vilna Ghetto. Her name was Pezele Bornstein. And she was, I think, 14 years old at the time of the, uh, of the, of, of, of the ghetto. Mm -hmm. And Pesele Bornstein told me the, uh, the story of the first day that they were chased out of their homes and driven into the ghetto. And it is a, it, it is a description of people 
uh, being driven from normal life into hell. Uh, to, to cut the long story short, so I describe, I repeated from my memory this her description. Um, uh, description. Into the and, play. Yeah, but I did it in English, and uh, and the, the Chinese translator Tracy uh, uh, Tracy uh, Chang was sitting at my side, and she was translating uh, uh, to Wang Keran what oh, I was said. telling him. And at the same time, she was uh, uh, writing the Chinese translation on her uh, uh, iPhone. And uh, the next day, I came to the rehearsals, and the, uh, uh, the diva of the, of the, of the company, uh, she, fan, she uh, said to me, can I uh, show you what we did with uh, your story? And I said, how come? She said, well, I learned it during the night, wow. and we opened the rehearsal, and then she started it, and she told the story. I mean, she, was, she played, she acted out the full story. The actors started to cry. That's and it was uh, such an experience. So I'm uh, I decided to include this uh, prologue, to change the, pro the prologue of the play. And now, uh, wherever Ghetto is done, I, um, I tell them to use this b uh, opening this of the version. play because it is much, I would say, it introduces the audience immediately into the situation of the Ghetto. You know, uh, there is no question that it was not a normal life there. Yeah. And so this is and what we did, yeah. And Ghetto really became, I think, the most um, successful Israeli play ever. Well, it, it was done, yeah. like, there were 80 production, 81 productions in major theaters, but there were so many other productions in uh, theaters of universities and small uh, theaters, which I even don't uh, uh, keep the account of. Yeah. So, yeah, it is. A, there, 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 were, there are now two or three productions waiting to be done the moment that uh, the crisis, the, done, the crisis of the corona will be over. Okay. An yes. international hit. Yeah. Uh, Hadar, you two uh, did a serious research pretty much like Yoshua uh, uh, described, uh, which preceded the writing of Ghetto with your, with your last play, with yeah, well, I, I do research with, with all my plays, but this, the research of the, of the Czech play was the most challenging because I suddenly realized that I'd agreed to be commissioned to write a Czech play. And I was in total terror for a few weeks after. Yeah, I'm making the stories fine, but when you have to go into the details, I'm not Czech. And, and the characters, the, the whole story there is about a family that suddenly find out that they're Jewish. So basically, it's like a Czech family that find out they're Jewish. It's, you, I can't base it on Judaisms. And uh, General I, 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 yeah, I mean, the characters there are, 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 are all Czech. <laughs> so you know what, because, because it didn't open and materialized uh, at the end, let's just see a short clip of this production. Oh, yes. Uh, in check from from the rehearsals room, uh, the the clip of of uh, not Jew Jewish enough. For yeah, Hitler. in in check the the title is my first Jewish Christmas. My first Jewish Christmas. Okay, let's see this clip. Dokud nepřestaneš s těmi hlouposmy, tak 
máš zákaz vstupu do jejich domů. identity, searching for identity, which is something I find myself in, uh, I think, all my life because, you know, I was born in London in a very orthodox family, but my father was Moroccan and from Israel, so, and we went to Israel and then we were British for the Israelis and Israeli for the British and then I was in uh, orthodox society, but I kind of floated away and uh, so for religious people, I'm secular, and for secular people, I'm, oh, that religious girl, woman. Mm. Um, so I, fi I find myself a lot an outsider and a lot of um, dealing with my own identity through, through theatre. Through theater. And it started with, with your first play, with, with Mikve. Yeah, it, it, st it started with satirically you know, with women's status in Jewish law as a stand-up. Mm -hmm. And then when uh, the head of the Beit Lesson Theatre, C.P. Pinus, saw my stand-up, she, she said, you're a great actress. She invited me to, for a meeting. I said, yes, yeah, she's going to offer me now a brilliant role. And then she said, uh, will you write a play for me? I said, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. She said, do you know how to write a play? I said, of course. I know how to write. <laughs> Uh, Goren Agmon was the dramaturge, that, uh, so I, I learned how to write uh, play, playwriting, the technique of playwriting whilst writing Mikva, actually. And um, yeah, I, but even though I came from this world, I researched a lot for Mikva as well. And each character there... Tell us just a bit, what, what is it about? Mikva? Well, it's, it's eight intertwining stories from eight different women, but um, Mikva is a ritual bath that women who are married are obliged to come to once a month seven clean days after their menstruation um, in order to be in physical contact again with their husbands. The husband is not allowed to touch them. Some would say not even allowed to be with them in the same room or laugh with them. Some say that, you know, the woman is not allowed to give a plate of food to her husband whilst she's still impure. Um, and so until she purifies herself in the mikveh, she cannot be in any physical uh, contact with him and not sleep with him. So it all happens in the mikveh. It all, it's all happens in the ritual bath when one new mikveh attendant arrives and um, she is not willing to kind of um, uh, keep quiet about the things that she sees because, you know, you can see everything in a mikveh. The women strip down naked physically and, uh, and emotionally. emotionally. So... Um, there is a girl that comes there night before her wedding because she must, but she, she's really scared of, of, of this contact with men because she's never been with a man and she hardly even knows this guy. She only met him twice. Or a battered wife who comes to the mikveh and uh, the young mikveh attendant kind of turns everything over. She, she, she decides to help the battered, the battered woman and that's kind of breaking the status quo that, the, that these women live in. And how is this play, which is very specific, very, very rooted in, in Jewish tradition, received, you know, by, by non-Jewish audiences around the world? Well, I, I, there is one, uh, one Czech director who kind of made it the beginning of his career on Mikva. Um, he, di he directed it in the National Theatre in the Czech Republic and in Slovakia and in uh, Romania, I think, too. Uh, another country. Um, but he was very sceptic about it. He actually 
decided to do it only because one of the leading actresses in his theater chose the play and he needed a part for her. Mm -hmm. She was, she's like the number one uh, actress there. And uh, he said to the actresses on the first day of rehearsals, I don't know how much our audience is going to be interested in the menstruation of Jewish women. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then he, on the dernier, on the last night, which was 12 years later, mm. I was with him. He said, I learned so much about what, mm. what theater is about through, through Mikveh. So, and uh, first of all, the women are those who buy the tickets in the end, you know, for their... <laughs> <Tell us, laughs> They're the ones that drag their tell, husbands. Tell us about it. <laughs> and right now, you, you, the last uh, production, you, you just opened or it just opened in, in Poland. Right. Yes, the last production was in, in Poland. In a very interesting timing. It was, supposed to, it was supposed to premiere in March. It was postponed and it went up uh, a couple of weeks ago and went back down into streaming only three, day, three or four days later. But the timing in Poland, you know, now is a time people are asking many existential questions and many people are going back to religion, actually. Mm -hmm. And in Poland, at these times, in 2020, um, uh, or... Uh, uh, there were large demonstrations. No, the uh, apalot. Abortion. Abortions are being prohibited again. Mm -hmm. Pro you know, no woman for any reason. By law. By law, yes, yeah. are allowed to, to have an abortion. And uh, it, it happened the, the day that Mikvah premiered. So um, all the PR of the, of the play and all the papers were about the, the Jewish uh, women in the theater are shouting the cry of the silent Polish women, mm -hmm. and it kind of urged them to go out to protest. So outside the theater, there was a protest, and the women from the theater afterwards joined the protest against, against this uh, new law and some other mm -hmm. laws. So, yes. L let's see just Timing that. is everything. You know? Timing is everything, mm -hmm. especially in theater. L let's see the short clip of this wonderful production, a uh, new one in, in Poland. And I, I just want to remind you that you can see the full production of the Israeli uh, um, production, which is right now at, at uh, Habima, our national uh, theater, in our very friendly, user friendly, and um, um, website. Błogosławiony jesteś, Boże, nasz Król Wszechświata, który uświęciłeś nas swoimi przekazaniami i nakazałeś nam zanurzanie się. W mykwie niczego nie wolno ukrywać, ale to nie daje nam prawa węszyć. Przełagam wszystko i milczę. I milczę. Przejdzie przez to tak, jak wszystkie przechodzą. A jeżeli nie, Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, you know what? Speaking of humor, let's let's move to Michal. You know, yeah, we had the Holocaust and ghetto, and, and, and uh, you are very, very well known for um, your Black sense humor. of humor. Black humor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Eccentric. Yes, I, I guess so. I'm kind of uh, in the middle of being a clown, modern clown, and. Uh, theater person, painter, and uh, I don't know, this mm. pu puppeteer, I don't know, I mean, merge. But yes, uh, humor saves me, and saved me, and I guess will save many people. I mean, this is, a, for me, the answer for it, many questions and problems. You know what, let's, let's uh, mm. let, uh, uh, give the, the pieces uh, talk or stand for themselves. We have uh, your show reel. Here is a collection of some of Michal Svironi's previous works, and and current ones. Let's see. Thank you. 
Wow, 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 wow. And you do everything yourself, right? You design and you perform? And... Uh, yes, I do. Not, I have my crew, you know, I have a um, very good crew, but I do, yes, I think that design, it's a, it's a double D, it's a design and direction, for me it's one. Mm -hmm. I cannot separate them, and this is why I think my pieces are, um, they talk for themselves, even if I have words in it, and though I speak three languages, uh, sometimes I cannot speak the, the local language, but the action, the visuals, it talks for itself. Stick for it's itself. In, yeah, yeah, it sticks it stick for itself, and it's international language, so yeah. this is why they can go ever, everywhere. everywhere. And, um, By the way, the, uh, later on, our next session is going, uh, we call it uh, Takeaway Theater, because it, it will be dedicated, and Michal will, will, will be there too, it will be dedicated to small-scale productions, because we believe that even once the corona is gone, there will be, you know, um, the odds of, of inviting small-scale productions are, are bigger than, you know, the, the, um, the big um, um, musicals and spectacular productions. So uh, you really fit in. You, you travel very easily. You're very easy to travel. Yes, I'm specialized in doing uh, shows that get into two suitcases in, in suitcase. and a maximum of 30 kilos, 32 kilos, and it's my speciality if you need any help <laughs> to adapt your big shows. And it looks big, but I'm like, wow, you put it in two, in two suitcases? Yes, we do. Um, you have to think about it before. But I just wanted to, to say that uh, um, we also performed in, the, in Singapore and um, Macau and other countries with uh, uh, our shows, my, with, especially with my show, The Hood, which is about uh, meeting also with people in little houses mm -hmm. that you could see in the in this clip, and we and we because of the language barrier we translated it of course to to the local language and it was played by um, we did it in many countries but I'm just talking about this part of the world so uh, mm. it is it was very uh, interesting um, event event uh, merde. oops. Adventure. Experience. 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 Great. I hope nobody speaks yeah. French here. Yeah. <laughs> nobody knows that word. Yeah. <laughs> Yoshua, uh, you, you had the experience <laughs> of having some of your plays done outside as well, even before being produced here. Yeah, yes. Although you write only in Hebrew, right? Sometimes in English also. Uh, well, uh, I wrote a, a play about Alma Mahler mm -hmm. that was... Uh, uh, done in Austria, first of all, uh, by uh, director Paulus Manker, an uh, Austrian mm -hmm. director. <coughs> so in order to uh, communicate with him, I wrote it in English originally and then translated it into Hebrew. But I had other plays that were uh, uh, premiered, first of all, uh, abroad and then in Israel, or sometimes not even in Israel, uh, like a play, uh, a new version about the uh, Yud Zeus, uh, the Jew Zeus, uh, based on new researches and uh, studies by historians who discovered uh, archives in Stuttgart about uh, the uh, this affair, mm. uh, Josef uh, Oppenheimer, this. So uh, the play opened in Stuttgart, the Altes Theater in Stuttgart, directed by Manfred Wagner. And uh, it's the, it, it waits to be done in Israel also, because I think it, there is an interest in... It's about the roots of anti-Semitism in the 18th century of uh, Europe, and especially in Germany. I'm interested uh, in the, in the um, um, transition from... You, you spoke earlier about the solitude of, of, of a writer, yeah. of a playwright, yes. and then the, the transition into directing. What, what, what triggered you to start directing your own plays? Well, I, I, always when my plays were done, I had a feeling that... Uh, Though I admire the vision of uh, other directors, I, I had my own vision of the, what the show should look like, mm -hmm. for instance. And, uh, well, when Peter Tzadek directed Ghetto, I asked him, do you want me to attend the rehearsals in Berlin at the time? And he said, no, 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 you know you play too well. I have to discover it. Yeah. So I, I respected it. And when I came, I saw that there were some scenes there that uh, he interpreted totally differently from what I uh, envisioned mm -hmm. originally. So, of course, uh, when you write, I mean, when I write, I, well, not only that I'm uh, speaking out uh, the dialogue uh, uh, in loud voice <laughs> in order to hear if it sounds okay for the character and so on, uh, but, of course, I have to uh, have a vision of what's taking place on the stage. 
And uh, then uh, if I have given the privilege to direct my own play, I try to uh, bring to the stage my own vision. But you'll get back to working with directors. It's not that you are I, from now on that that's the only way for you to do it. No, no, no. Uh, well, I love to work with actors. I because must I'm say. Because I'm interested personally. That, yeah, that, well, that of course. If question. you're interested okay. personally, let's talk uh, business afterwards. afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. I really, uh, I love to have uh, that contact with. Uh, another director who is the, um, bringing my play from the page to the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, because this transition from the page to the stage is critical. You know, you can kill a play or you can give it, um, insufflate it with much more life. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, so, uh, of course, this uh, process, uh, this uh, uh, transition is, is it's critical, it's interesting, it is... Uh, so, yes, of course, I, I, I like very much to work with the other directors, not with myself as a director. No. Yeah. It takes off also my, I mean, the, the curse of the responsibility, you know, for all yeah, to divide production. It. Yes. Yeah, 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 sure. Let's move now to uh, Nava Semel, another wonderful uh, playwright, the late Nava Semel. Uh, she passed away two years ago. Uh, and her one uh, women show, The Child um, Behind the Eyes, uh, was done here in Israel. Actually, there is a new production right now at the Haifa Municipal Theater and around the world. And we'll get to see a clip from the Slovenian production directed by Jonathan Estrakin. Let's see it. As I had it towards the door of the newborn sword, still carrying the bundle, the nurse ran after me. Excuse me, lady, uh, where do you think you are taking him? For his feeding, I said. Can't you see that your thumb is hungry? Just like that, out of the blue, the name popped into my head, your thumb. I filled out the forms for school. I kept writing it in. Your time. Your time. I love writing his name. Sometimes I add some designs to the letters and color them for him. I won't be able to do his learning for him though. Maybe I shouldn't wake him. Just let him sleep. I'm scared. It's a jungle out there. There were just a handful of people at the circumcision ceremony. Hello. It's not that we didn't invite anyone, on the contrary. Nobody asked to see the baby, except the children. For them, he was just another new baby. Yotam lay there in our bedroom in the same wicker bassinet we used for Talia. Peaceful and sleepy. Every child who asked to see him, I took right in, and they, oh, and, ah, and ask permission to play with his tiny fingers. Talia asked me in a whisper, why grandma was crying? Not my grandma Erika, but David's mother. She'd been against inviting people to the circumcision. What a disgrace we'd brought on her family, distinguished merchants from Warsaw. Maya Carmel had tarnished the dynasty. She brought a defective prince into the world. 
very moving story of a mother to a child with a Down syndrome. Uh, Hada, you too have a new one-woman show, Whistle. Yeah. Whistle, I wrote it together with Yaakov Bouchan, whose mother was the secretary of Dr. Mengele, the Dr. Mengele. Mm. But he, what he wanted to transfer is the experience of being second generation. The, the wounds, the, the unseen wounds, because you don't have any, you don't have any physical wounds, but it leaves the, these children, this second generation, very scarred. And uh, Whistle tells the story of a woman who reaches the age of 45, and she suddenly realizes that she's never really loved properly or been loved, and she has an opportunity. So she's beginning the play with asking permission from her husband to have a relationship with someone else. But she needs to go through so many ghosts, including the ghost of her mother, who was Mengele's secretary, um, who never let her uh, live, never let her laugh. There was no music in the house. There was no hugging and no kissing. And the only thing that she had was her whistle, which uh, got lost two and a half years before the beginning of the play. And she, she's trying to find this whistle back to help her live. Oh. And it's going to be translated into Chinese? And yeah, Yu Ting Yi uh, saw it on the exposure and she asked if she could translate it to Chinese. Yeah. So, of course, I said, with love. It's already yeah, been yeah. translated to five languages. It yeah. only went up last uh, April, April 2019. Before Corona, we managed to perform with it in London, in Czech Republic, and uh, tour uh, in the U.S., and uh, we had to cancel Russia and Italy and um, Slovakia. So. <laughs> Our hope is not yet lost and not it lost, will, not yet. we shall overcome. I also uh, fit into a suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> one suitcase. One, she, one. She, she <laughs> um, we promised to shed light on, on the diversity of the uh, local theatrical scene. So let's now move to a dance theater, two brilliant um, um, uh, choreographers. Um, Or Marin and Oran Nahum created Raining Men Carnival um, on, on the battlefield. Uh, let's see just these short clips. <laughs> And 
can you know you can? Yeah, refreshing, yeah. Um, questions of manhood, womanhood, uh, gender will be uh, discussed uh, tomorrow at a separate session, which is called Let's Play It by Gender. You are more than welcome. By the way, I don't know if you noticed, but you have this Q&A button uh, in, in the webinar that you can try, should you wish to comment or ask uh, any question to any of our panelists or whatever, you, you, you can use it and, and we see it and we can address any, anything that you write there. Uh, Shimrit, if anyone is interested in reaching out to you and, and maybe getting the rights for producing an Israeli play, what, Okay, what so should, what um, actually the Institute of Israeli Drama is, um, fun it functions like every other agency in the world. So if you are interested in uh, purchasing performance rights or publishing rights or stage readings or uh, university works, whatever you want to do with Israeli plays or if you just want to read some and know what you have, uh, we have also two Chinese uh, and many uh, other languages, uh, basically English, but many others. So you can just send me an email. Uh, I think my email should be, yes, it's out there. Uh, you can just write to me, I'm interested in plays such as this and this, or I noticed something in your website. By the way, in the, in the website of the exposure, there is a button, its name is About. And if you go there, you can see the programs of previous years from uh, 2000, 2016. And if you see anything that you like, you can just write to me and I'll help you to uh, reach out to the artists or to have the performance rights. Uh, so just uh, write to me and uh, we can keep in touch. Thank you, Shimrit. Uh, Yoshua and Adar, I have an identical question to both of you because uh, you two also teach dramatic writing or, or used to teach. Uh, what's the most important skill or a tip you can give from your own experience to, to a young writer? Um, well, uh, usually when I meet a class for the first time, mm -hmm. I tell the students uh, to see what kind of subject they cannot in avoid. Uh, what is the must? What them? is the must, yes. So I, I tell them, look, there are so many subjects around here in the air. But uh, whatever you can avoid, avoid it. If there is something that imposes itself on you, then obey. Uh, uh, this is what I can say. Although I must say <laughs> yes. that, that uh, studying your own career, yeah. you were imp imposed your first subject, if I, if I remember correctly. You, uh, you didn't think of writing this first play about the old, the, people? The, the old people. Someone imposed it on you. Well, it started with a meeting between Nola Chilton, director Nola Chilton and myself, mm -hmm. and she asked me, uh, I didn't know what, uh, why she wanted to meet me because the theater, they wrote to me a letter saying if you are, you are interested in doing some work for the theater, please meet Nola Chilton. Uh, and I'm, I went to her place in a kibbutz in Slot Yam and met her. And the first thing she said to me was, uh, what, uh, what are you afraid of? What is the thing that uh, comes to your mind when I ask you what uh, insto instills fear into your heart. Or, and I said, getting older, okay. uh, becoming old. And she said, excellent. So I said, why? And she said, because I want to do a play, a I documentary know. about uh, old people in Israel. Mm -hmm. So she said to me, this is a good starting point. If you are afraid of it, go and meet go your fear. It. Go and meet your fear. Mm -hmm. So uh, I and think this is also a, a good idea, for because uh, things you are afraid of, are probably things that, or uh, it's subject matter that um, somehow uh, inspires you, so to speak. It, it creates, uh, you have to confront it, you have to... It moves you. It's you have to jump into the fire or the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that the, this is a, one important thing about playwriting. It is uh, going over the border. 
uh, not staying inside this uh, yeah, the, the comfortable uh, territory where you feel at home. I don't think there is any, any interesting drama that may come out from the places where you feel comfortable. It's only when you cross the border and you go into the zones of uh, fear, the zones of apprehension, the zones of uh, uncertainty, things that menace, that threaten you, that you are uh, um, opening up uh, things inside yourself, but also if it, it instills fear into... Uh, my heart, it's probably instills fear into the hearts of many people. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that you, you gather an audience and you have to uh, somehow, to them, not only frighten them, but to, to tackle the nerves that are, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think, the, um, the, 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 the most crucial tip. Yeah, that's right. Great. And yours, Hada, what do well, you actually, teach them? Some, some of my students are here on the tech, on the tech team. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I feel like, uh, Joshua, that uh, when, when you want students to be able to begin to write, and writing, uh, writing, drama writing is, is, a lot, is a lot technique. There's, there's um, many people write today. You see the Facebook, you see blogs. People are all the time writing and writing and writing mm. and writing. But it, it depends. Everyone what, is a computer, right? It's very, right. Yeah. What you want to write about and how you are connected, really, to your inner pains and fears. And usually, in the first, uh, the first or second lesson, I will say first of all that drama. Uh, uh, um, a sentence they hear from me nonstop is drama is relationships. The biggest stories in history are told to us through uh, through the tiny prisma of relationships. And the change in history is also through changing in relationships. And um, I will tell them to think of people who are around them, people who are close to them, with whom they, um, with whom they are keeping a status quo and not confronting some kind of personal, personal issue. I will tell them to write a letter, a letter, not a, not a scene, just a letter with all their feelings, taking all the shit out, excuse my language, uh, putting everything on, everything they never told them because they were scared of breaking the status quo, to write it down. And I don't tell them though the second part of this exercise until the first part is finished. The second part is, of this exercise is to now to write the answer. Hmm. Now write the answer. But go, if, you, if you think you know the answer and you're writing what you have in your head, I say to them, then that's not the answer. The answer is something that needs to surprise even you when you write it. And amazing things come from this uh, exercise. So. You told me about what we have a mutual student. Yes. You told me that last year, she, Please tell the yes, story. Yes, th this yeah. uh, student, she's like uh, 60 plus, and her letter was to, she uh, was brought up in Iran, Ira Iran, I think, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, she was married at the age of 16 or 17. Her letter was to her, uh, was to her cousin from when she was 14 years old. She really wanted him to marry her. There the cousins get married, but he chose a different cousin, and she was full of remorse of this. She, until today, she felt that he'd made a, made a mistake and she still has feelings towards him. And the cousin that he chose wasn't such a good wife. And, but when she wrote his answer, she, she suddenly realized that he, he really did try to court her. And he tried, to, he tried to, to get close to her and she kept pushing him away. Mm -hmm. And this was something that she'd never realized until she wrote the letter. Oh. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, there is an exercise that I also used to do with my students. I uh, told them to put a, uh, to place an empty chair in front mm -hmm. of them, and to uh, imagine uh, someone is sitting in that on, on chair. that chair, um, and to put there a person with whom they have an unfinished business. Yes, mm -hmm. that's the... And then address the person there in the chair and come out with everything they have to say to that person, uh, and then go and sit in the chair <laughs> and uh, answer. <laughs> but uh, when, when I, I want just to, to tell you about one scene that oh. took place sometime. Uh, we, a, a guy stood up, he put, he, we so. put the chair, and he, sta he started to prepare himself to, uh, to talk to the person in the chair. And he was, you know, and we were all sitting there uh, frightened because it came out from him such an energy and such... I thought he's going to explode, and it wasn't taking, well, I don't know how long it took, but it took a while, uh -huh. and I said, okay, that's it, 
I finished. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't say a word, but it was so dramatic, well, you well. know. And I didn't ask him who he placed in the chair. It was, it's not about the words. It's not about the not words. About words. Yeah. You could see uh, a relationship, a whole relationship, wow. uh, of someone who somehow muted him, you know? Wow. I, I could think it was his father, or maybe a teacher, or maybe a commander in the army, or someone who muted him. Wow. And, and this kind of relationship of being muted by someone came out with such a power yeah. without saying a word, of course, wow. you know? Yeah. What a lesson. Yes, please. Because it's very interesting for me to hear what you say, because I teach uh, how to, not to write, because I'm not teaching writing, mm -hmm. I'm not, uh, but uh, just to create theater. And uh, it's interesting because I, the, the focus that we have is, is different. It's about process more than drama, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's about playfulness more than... Um, I, but still very close to yourself, and I'm very happy that you say it because I, because I hear so many people that say, uh, that have many things to say against theater that you speak about yourself, because I think that the process that we do and we need to teach them is how to come from yourself, and, but to find the language, the artistic language, that it will not stay private, but it will become... Uh, speak, yeah. And I have also this just a little uh, chair exercise that we do, and it's, uh, it's funny to hear the differences because it, in this exercise we put the chair and people are blind. And then they have to go to the chair, just to go to the chair. And this creates uh, a lot of fun, a lot of fear, a lot of feelings, and you just need to be aware of them and to express them in a minor way, just to enjoy this. And, the, and uh, when they find the, the chair very fast, they are very frustrated. Mm. And when it takes a lot of time, they are very happy. And this is like about uh, the, mi the microcosmos of, of creation, of I think, process. to let yourself, and you know. When they're yeah. blindfolded, you take the chair yeah. away and they're looking oh, for Oh, sometimes I, I am <laughs> abusing, yeah. <laughs> sometimes I do horrible things. I wish but I were your student. I yeah. Add, uh, as uh, someone who reads a lot of plays uh, in Hebrew, in um, various processes of writing, uh, both by uh, well-known playwrights and uh, new writers and writers in the middle, my uh, advice is just to rewrite again and again and again. I know that you've heard it so many times, but sometimes a young writer says, this is the wonderful creation of my life. I just wrote it, it's hot from the oven. Read it, read it, and I say just, patient, please. Wait a few weeks, give your friends, find a dramaturg, find a director, uh, have a, a stage reading with actors and a, and, a, and a process of creation, and then you will face the, uh, the other partners of the playwriting, the director, the designer, the actors, and you will have to change the text, and the text will be changed so many times. And sometimes I see draft number four is sent to an artistic department of a theater. Why number four? Why not number 17? Because then the process before rehearsing will be much easier because you cannot um, help a play when it's not written very well. So. I think just yes, rewrite. I must tell you that from the other side, you know. Yeah, I know. When you, when you, when you write yeah. for TV, first of all, they give you, you know, sit down, write, we'll yeah. pay you this and this, and then, but for theater, first, you know, come to draft number 17, and then we'll speak. I never <laughs> saw draft number 17 in the theater. <laughs> oh, you never? <laughs> only, in, only in TV. But it's true. Start with draft number 17 <laughs> and go down. Yeah. Great. Um, and now you are about to experience for the very first time, I think, opera. You told me that Mikve is going to oh, be yes. adapted. Oh, um, yes. Mikve, um, two creators, Esther uh, and Judith, uh, Esther Orban and Judith uh, Varga, uh, um, from Hungary and Austria, from the streaming in the corona times. Uh -huh. uh, Judith saw Mikve, and she's a, a composer, and a professor of music, and um, she decided she wanted to make it into a contemporary opera. Uh, and uh, Esther Orban uh, did the translation of Mikva to Hungarian, and she's also a, a lyricist herself, so she's doing the, the adaption. Uh, I'm involved in some way, but uh, they just went through um, stage two, and they got a positive uh, reaction, so... Maybe Mikve will be an uh, opera now. Wow, okay. Let's wait for the... New seven, Horizons. For, for, for the 17th draft. 17 drafts <laughs> first, yeah. 
Okay, thank you um, very much, uh, all of you. I just want to remind you that some of the guests you, you'll, you'll be able to meet later on in our program. Uh, today we have two more sessions. One is the um, Takeaway Theater and the other one dedicated to Hanoch Levin. And tomorrow Hadar will host, uh, will, will be the moderator of another panel which we call From Page to Stage about the adaptation of literary works into the stage. And we have another uh, panel tomorrow, Let's Play It by the Gender. I thank you all very much. I hope we managed to shed some light on the diversity of the theatrical scene here. I think Israeli theater and, and, and playwrights have a lot to offer. And uh, should you wish to get some further information, you are more than welcome to reach out to Shumrit and everybody else here. I see that we had guests from Myanmar in the chat. Welcome. It's a pleasure having you for the very first time here with us. And thank you all and see you later on. Thanks a million. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.